Hey, I'm once again joined by Archie Ivy, the longtime manager and assistant and all kinds of things to the P-Funk organization, specifically George Clinton and Archie. Good to see you again. How are you today? I'm doing well. Doing well, thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm, I'm doing good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we had so much fun last time, but man, it's such a big story. We got to tell some more. Okay, not a problem. <laughs> We've got lots of them. <laughs> yeah. So I think when we left off, we were somewhere around um, late 70s era, something like that. Um, we talked about some of the great characters and specifically uh, George Clinton's genius uh, and some of the other guys, too. Um, I wanted one guy that you didn't mention. We we mentioned Bernie and uh, Bootsy and all those other guys, but we didn't mention Junie. Um, what was your take on Junie? He's such an, an enigma. That, that's my take on Junie. He's an <laughs> enigma. <laughs> Junie is uh, Junie was what well, was. Uh, uh, God bless him. He he's he's basically a quiet guy, but. Um, noise going on in his mind. You generally associated around music. I'm not saying he was crazy. I'm just saying the wheels were always turning. He was always hearing things. He was always doing things. He was a um a meticulous leader. For a while he was the the band leader out on the road. And he uh you know P Funk was notorious for not having rehearsals. Like people would come and sound check and wing it. Well, Junie put a regimen to that, and uh, the shows got extremely tight, especially the vocals. He rehearsed them uh, relentlessly on the road, and uh, uh, things got exciting. But I think the thing that most amazed me about George was the song uh, Knee Deep. George had that song in his head for about uh, two years. And uh, we would be riding from city to city on the road, and he would keep singing that song over and over and over again to where I, I actually thought I could have played it. I could have produced it. I knew the song so well. And we were doing it, and he was singing himself, and he's round and round the floor. And one day he asked, he said, can 3-4 go with 4-4? Four, four? Can you mix a 4-4 four, four beat with a 3-4 beat? And I said, yeah, they would probably just count it in 6-8, which was kind of crazy. And he looked at me strange, and he said, okay. And then about a few months later, he was ready to record it. And he goes to Junie. And he asked him the same thing. And I remember Junie says, it can be done. <laughs> That's all he said was, it can be done. And George sang that whole arrangement to him. And that was one of the few times that George... Uh, but he knew exactly how it was going in his head. And Junie listened to him do it one time down, went in the studio by himself, all by himself, and then come out. He comes out mm, maybe three, four hours at the max later with this incredible track, okay? He was, Junie was a, um, uh, I don't want to say a mathematician, but he put things together like that. If if you really dissect that track, things are so well knitted together. He's one of the few people that can play all the instruments himself and you not tell it's one person. Uh, uh, it, 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 he's able to uh, uh, dive, uh, uh, I guess you say have schizophrenia in terms of the instruments that he played. And it's, an, it's a, an amazing track, the subtlety of the keyboard parts and then the guitar licks and, of course, the bass line. And he put that whole track together. It was just him. And I, I thought that, and so, uh, Enigma, yeah, he's, he was a strange guy to, uh, uh, to get to know, but you couldn't help but love him. Okay. Junie was, uh, he, he was, he was brilliant. Did, did he uh, tend to party with any of the guys or kind of stay to himself? He kind of stayed to himself. Uh, I'm not going to uh, snitch on anybody <laughs> as far as what we did at, at the hotels afterwards and stuff. But Junie, uh, he had his own, uh, let's say, routine. 
that he would go through. And it, it didn't, he didn't do much hanging out, you know. Uh, a lot of times it was hanging out after the shows. People would go from room to room and just to see what was going, if anybody had any fans or, or, or groupies or whatever in excess in their room that they needed the, some relief or space from. Uh, people just, you know, they fraternized uh, like that. But Junie wasn't, he didn't do that that much. Junie was, um, he, he was in his personal space. And he was, he was, he was, uh, he took everything very seriously. Whose whose idea was it to let Felipe win Unleash on that track? Felipe? Yeah, who's who said, hey, man, just go to it for no, that track? That, I'm saying it was Felipe's idea. He was he was in the studio, and uh, when George was, uh, you know, Felipe used to be with uh, with Bootsy, and he was uh, 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 for George a while. Uh, yeah. I, actually, when it was the rubber band, right? And uh, um, when um, I don't know what the reason why he came by the studio that day, but it was right around the same time as Junior finished the track, and George listened to it. He's playing to it. And he had started putting the vocals on it, and he had Gary and the girls in the background, and it was coming together. And Felipe was in the studio one day, and um, he used to call George and Bud. He said, hey, Bud, you think I can get on that? <laughs> and, and George was like, you know, he wasn't going to ask, you know, it's Felipe Wynn, right? Lead singer to Spinners. And so he was, wasn't going to ask him to be on a, a, a Funkadelic track. But when Felipe asked, he said, sure. And so uh, 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 and the 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 um, he did his own vocal arrangement. George didn't tell him what to sing. That's why the famous line is when he realized he was in there singing to a, a funk song. He says, "Could this be me?" He <laughs> burst the funk so deep, right? All that was ad libbed. Uh, he uh, uh, it was a, a great experience. And you know, Felipe was a whole nother. He was out there at the same time when Junie was out there, and Junie had tightened everything up. And it was one part of the show which was a complete departure from uh, funkadelic madness. Uh, we, we, we called it organized chaos, right? From uh, just the things that would be happening. George would refer to himself as a ringmaster, and, and funk, P Funk was like a circus. And uh, then Felipe's part of the show would come, and it would be. Um, it would all come together and the band became like uh, the perfect backup band for a uh, a, 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 a standard stand-up R&B singer. And believe me, he used to wear a tuxedo. <laughs> Everybody else was in their crazy wild things. He'd come out there in a single, a, a tuxedo, and he would sing Sadie. And it would turn the place out, okay? You know, Sadie's a powerful song. Uh, uh, uh. I, I I never really asked him that, but it uh, if that was actually a song to his mother, I just assumed that that was a song too and about his mother. But um, yeah, he, he was he was a great guy too. Uh, you know, my house uh, with, with uh, uh, my wife and kids, and uh, we lived in Inglewood, right? Uh, uh, like right near the forum off of uh, between uh, Crenshaw and Van Ness, right? Right. And are probably the only or the best neighborhood in Inglewood, okay? Where uh, even to this day, it was never infested with any gangs or stuff like that. It was a pretty, pretty nice area to be in. But um, George would come by, and Gary, all P-Funk people, you know, they would come by when they're in town, they would come and stop over. And the neighbors never noticed them. But one day Felipe came over <laughs> and Felipe came over and then I was a big wig on the on the block, okay? <laughs> because people started seeing they looked out or I don't know how they knew it, but all of a sudden he he had a, a bunch of admirers uh, uh, that was around him and uh, uh, it was uh, he was he was special. He was very kind to people. He was and he was ultimately a professional. Um he used to criticize uh, people when they would get too lax, and uh, uh, he he would uh, he would call them out, especially if they were playing and were not right, making everything crisp and exactly where it was supposed to be. That's, that's perfect, per perfect for his role in the Uncle Jam's Army song. Exactly right. He was a drill sergeant. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. That, that story you tell me about um, him with you in Inglewood that reminds me of kind of like a throwback to your mom with the Lewis Gossett thing. Exactly. It was another situation. Yeah. It, 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 when you get validation, it, it's not from every, I mean, because I, I really do appreciate uh, the guys that I work with, the role I played in the history, because I truly believe that George and P Funk turned music, or when we said Rex, rescue dance music from the blahs, that was real. And we turned music from a direction that it was headed. And pointed, especially dance music, pointed it in a new direction. And to this day, nobody has been able to do that. Everybody, everything else is like a, um, if you look at the tree of the development, when I was at UCLA, there was this guy there named uh, Willie Ruff. And he was part of the Mitchell Ruff trio. But he taught this class called the Afro-American Musical Heritage. And he traced the uh, history of black music from Africa through the Caribbean, up through New Orleans, and on up to uh, the blues up to Chicago and Memphis and all the stops. And it was, it was wonderfully done. But I connected that to what was going on then with, with Detroit and Philadelphia, those sounds. And then here comes George, which is, is like he created, it was a, like a budding branch right then. Uh, R&B took became different from blues, which was different from jazz. And this this wonderful tree of life of, of Africa, Afro-American musical heritage tree. And George had this new branch that was going on. And that branch now has ventured off. It became rap. It became hip hop. And even whatever people do now, uh, their roots are still in the characteristics of funk. And, and that is something that um, the sun is setting here. So my, the light is coming on. But that is the characteristic that is uh, um, something I'm proud to be a, have been a part of. Oh, man, for good reason. I mean, that's just historical right there. Um, I want to mention when you were going through some of those things like um, the uh, Felipe Wynn just being at the studio for that knee deep. Some of those uh, tracks, as great as they are, it seems like there were certain things that were just um, either happenstance or fate, however you want to look at it. I remember talking to George about One Nation and the banjo part on that that helps make that stand out so much. And yeah. he said that that was pretty much like an accident. There was just like a banjo player around the studio. you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's funny how that stuff works out. Yeah, and that was like I said. That's George. That was George's brilliance. He wasn't afraid to try those kind of things, you know. Uh, another one, uh, 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 shit, goddamn, get off your ass and jam. When he recorded that one, the song "Get Off Your Ass and Jam," um, Eddie was supposed to be there, but he didn't show up to the studio that night, and it was time for a guitar solo. And this guy came off and came by, and he didn't even have a. Um, he didn't have a case. He just said it was him and his guitar. He came in the studio and uh, he said, hey, man, can I play on that? Uh, uh, I, I just want $50. You don't have to worry about it. And uh, he goes in and in one take, he puts down this this blazing like the, the lead. If you listen to the lead guitar on that, it's like intense energy, right? He got $50 he left. We didn't even get his name. So I don't even think we documented who he was on the album. It's almost like it's like a crossroads story or something. Yeah. This yeah. mysterious figure. You know, I think that may have been the first funky look song I ever heard, believe it or not, like at house parties in Santa Monica growing yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'd heard I'd already I was already into the mothership, but I think that was the first funkadelic, and then the first record I got was hardcore jollies. And then I went back. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Archie, what was a typical day like for you if you can do your best to encapsulate what a typical day might have been like for you in the mid or late seventies being part of the funk mob. <laughs> uh, okay. There were no typical days, <laughs> uh, but uh, because there was the different responsibilities. And one of the things I really enjoyed about the industry itself and what we were doing was that it wasn't typical uh, uh, at things, uh, but basically uh, it was dealing with record companies that didn't understand what we were doing. And uh, that was really George um, 
trusting me to be able to communicate what he wanted to do and to translate it to those those individuals and to get them to uh, to go along with it. So uh, uh, that was part of it, just dealing with the record companies. And then uh, it, it was dealing with 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 the band guys, you know, band, bands always have things going. But mostly um, by this time we had, um, I think we had to open up, yeah, the World Funk headquarters. So we actually had an office on Hollywood and Vine. And it, it wasn't just me, it was like a team of guys. George referred to us as the dream division. And we came up with the marketing stuff and we organized the promotions and things like that. And the, uh, the guys that I knew, they were part of my fraternity. I'm in a, a black fraternity. It was Kappa Alpha Psi, and, um, which is ironic because one of our, uh, it's not like competitors, it's, it's fun, but a, a, a competitor fraternity, Omega Psi Phi, they have adopted Atomic Dog as their you know anthem, right? So I, I always joke, they always, uh, uh, I think they even made George an honorary member. But I always uh, joke with them. I say, noops run it. That's what they call us, noops. That's an aside story. But in the office, there were two of my fraternity brothers who I went to college with and who I'd known. Uh, one was Bruce Peterson and one was Ron Brimbry. Uh, Ron became, uh, uh, he stayed on to be, uh, uh, when Bootsy was going out, he would go out as Bootsy's road manager. But uh, we were the dream division. And, you know, they had backgrounds. Like, okay, it was Bruce comes from, uh, he came from, I think he worked with, uh, it was Procter & Gamble as a sales rep. And it was, he pointed us in the direction of how important it was for us to identify our own space in record stores. So one of our missions was to take funk out of the R&B section and to identify what was called a funk section in the record store. And so there was a number of steps and things, I won't bore you through the whole process, but we eventually achieved that goal uh, 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 in, in having funk recognized as a legitimate section. So you would come in when it first came, I remember uh, it was only Funkadelic stuff in there, <laughs> Funkadelic and Parliament stuff in there. Then the other uh, labels wanted their acts put in that section too, because they saw the impact it was having. People were identifying funk as a thing. And so Commodore's uh, albums would be in there. Cameo's albums would be in there. Cool and the Gang got in there. But I remember Earth, Wind & Fire always resisted it. And um, they're, they're, uh, one of their close confidants that I kept in touch with and stuff, he explained it to me, he said, we don't want to be limited to a funk budget. Like they were pop, okay? And they wanted their marketing and all that stuff to stay associated with pop. And uh, uh, it worked, it didn't hurt them. They, they were very successful in doing that. But uh, this was all part and it played a role in our ability. Uh, and the other one, uh, Ron Brimley, I mentioned, his background was in marketing and advertising. And so uh, uh, we had these campaigns, we had these programs, uh, uh, we labeled, uh, like I said, every year, uh, we, we targeted uh, from Thanksgiving through the holiday season as when we wanted to be number one. And we actually had, one year we had this whole campaign where it was Remember December, this funk month. And that's how we marketed it. And, and we had Zap out and what it, all the releases were out there and coordinated at that time. And we did something that uh, nobody thought was possible. We got all of the record companies, all these records are on different labels, and we got them all to take to coordinate, let us coordinate their record, their buys, their marketing buys, so we could put them all behind one thing. And it worked out pretty good for us. Um, of course, it helped to have uh, more mouse on top of the charts and, uh, 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 I think it was, uh, must have been Aqua Boogie. Something was around that time, yeah. No, Aqua Boogie was 78, so that would have been before more bounce. Okay. Well, what I'm trying to think, I can't remember what other album. Oh, it was Trumpipulation. That's what it was. Yeah. Trumpipulation, that one. It was, uh, 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 it was the, the one about Acting the culture Bootsies. And Felipe Wynn's album was out. Yeah. yeah. I think 
definitely 78 seemed to be the year when it just completely peaked. Um, yeah. I mean, everything was on firing on full cylinders, that Bootsy album, the Funkadelic album, the Parliament album, um, Brides, Horny Horns. Uh, that year, you know, was yeah. like, yeah. yeah. And, and it was something, when you say it peaked, it hadn't peaked. Commercially. But, but no, yeah, but, but no, but what I meant, what I meant by that saying it hadn't peaked is that we were st- we were just gaining momentum. But what happened, a couple of things happened. We did the deal. Uh, it was around that time we started negotiating for our own label. And that made the other labels paranoid because what most houses or most people, uh, production companies would have done is take their biggest acts away from the labels where they were. Warner Brothers and Casablanca, at this time it was, I think, Polygram had entered the picture. They were both afraid that we were going to take those albums and put them on whatever company we made a deal with. Uh, but that was never the first thing from our mind because we had a, a collective of people that we were going to need to release product through, right? And uh, um, so that that never happened. But their paranoia, uh, we we had resistance uh, with uh, marketing. Uncle Jam wants you. They 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 didn't. They wanted to control it. As a matter of fact, they told us uh, 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 that they weren't. Uh, we were having arguments with promoting it. And George just, uh, I get a phone call one night from somebody in Detroit saying, "Is has George got a new record out?" And I said, "No." I say, well, this it, it's a record on um, on it was a guy now I can't remember his name now, but it was the Midnight Funk Society, and the, the DJ he came on at midnight and he was playing this release right, and he it was a misrelease. He wouldn't say who it was, but it was knee deep, and George had given it to him to play, and then. Uh, it ended up and went from there. They heard about it in St. Louis and they had it. So we had this Funkadelic record that was playing all over there and Warner Brothers hadn't even heard it yet. They got so pissed at that, okay, because it took away their whole thing. Uh, uh, and they started, I remember George was going to the stage and this one guy named Eddie Gilry, who was the head of promotion, the R&B promotion, um, was George was going to the stage and Eddie's walking behind him yelling to his ear, you shouldn't have done that, George. It's not going to go pop. It's not going to go pop. And, and they proceeded to prove to us uh, uh, by um, their, uh, 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 not allowing it to go pop. <laughs> uh, they, they didn't give it promotion. So everything that Knee Deep achieved, it achieved basically uh, on the strength of its own legs. Uh, uh, and that whole album, Uncle Jam Wants You. Uh, uh, we were flaunting stuff. If you look at the cover again, where you see George sitting in that chair, a lot of people don't know where that comes from. But that was actually a, a, a homage to uh, Huey Newton and the Black Panther Party, uh, uh, where Huey Newton had a, a famous poster that all the revolutionaries from that era had on their walls where he would he was sitting in that same type of chair with his legs crossed and he had a it might have been a spear and a gun uh, 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 and George has a pop gun and a flashlight right with the same thing Uncle Jam wants you and uh, 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 so we knew the impact of that but we weren't we weren't we were identifying with that unity but not promoting violence we were saying like you know. Uh, going back to One Nation, here's our chance to dance our way out of our constrictions. Okay, and and that was um, and that was the approach. Uh, it was mindful. So uh, when you say it peaked, uh, it was it was beginning to catch fire then, and the record companies stopped it. Uh, when when by the time we got the deal with uh, 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 CBS for Uncle Jam Records. Uh, we were ready to hit it into high gear. And uh, we had Rod Bootsy had made a uh, a promise to Roger Troutman. They were in elementary school or something that whichever one would make it first would help the other one. 
And uh, so when, when Bootsy came to George and he said, you know, I want you to check out this man. We went to Dayton. We saw Roger play. He's talented. And uh, 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 so they were performers and George said, okay, you know, we'll give him a deal. And so we started recording Roger. And then uh, halfway through that process, Roger needed more of an influx of cash. And so we got him a deal with uh, Warner Brothers for Zap which was still Roger, but it was that. And the executive over at Warner Brothers named Bob Kraz now, when uh, he was real excited to sign that because, and especially after the record came out, More Bounce, he was real excited, okay? It was a, uh, I don't know, I'm probably skipping a couple of years in your timeline, but it was, he was really excited about that happening. And, uh, uh, but then when he went to, uh, we, we also got Roger in place because of our our relationship with promoters that was handling our tours. We got Rogers placed on, uh, on uh, we got Roger, it was Roger and the human body. And then, it, but it became Zap because they, they blew up so big. We got them placed on tour as the opening act for the Commodores. And so they went out with the Commodores and this record was on fire and it was just... But when they came to, uh, when Warner Brothers people came to the concert, they saw that Roger was the the big attraction. It wasn't Zap, it was Roger. Zap was actually the name of the, I think he was the drummer, one of Roger's brothers. And um, he got extremely upset with that and uh, then proceeded to induce Roger to break his agreement with us and uh, then sign with Warner Brothers. And, uh, you know, I was from Compton, Georgia's from Newark. We've never dealt with contracts, not with contracts in general. I'm talking about me having a contract with him or any things like that because uh, your word is your bond, okay? And that was the way we approached things. And if it was anything that by me having a marketing background and stuff uh, uh, that I regret, and I can't even say regret, but had I known then what I know now, I would have paid more attention to the publishing and what was happening with that, as well as to having people under contract. So it was no hurry to get the contract with Roger. And so one day, uh, uh, and we knew we knew what we had in the can. We knew that I heard it through the grapevine was going to be a big hit. And we were going to deliver that to uh, the Uncle Jam records at CBS. And then one day Roger goes to the studio and tells the studio that he's uh, going to go to Dayton to put horns on his on his recording. And he took the tapes and then took them to uh, Warner Brothers and uh he signed with them with the same stuff. He even took the same artwork. He had already turned in the artwork that we had given to CBS. And uh, I mean, there's there's more to that story about what happened because we did pursue it. We, we didn't have a contract, so he didn't he didn't uh, uh, we didn't have the rights to him, but he also didn't have the rights to the material because we had paid for it and. Uh, we 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 took him to court on that, and this is how things cross. I don't know if you remember, there was this general in the Vietnam War. His name was General Westmoreland, and he was about to sue CBS and uh, over uh, the release of the information of something a big time about the Vietnam War. And this was going to be big. Now, this is in the 80s now when this is happening. Uh, this was going to be a big case. And it was on the same, uh, it was in the same court, the, the Southern District of New York, that we were in with Warner Brothers, suing Warner Brothers for having interfered with our agreement um, with with Roger. At the same time, uh, Funky Dog still under contract to Warner's, right? What? At that same time, Funkadelic was still under contract to Warner's also, right? Oh, yeah. We were still in the contract. Yeah. With so you're suing a label that Funkadelic was contracted with. And, and Which will let you understand why uh, Electric Spanking and War Babies got no, no love whatsoever when it came to promoting it. 
uh, the previous album, Uncle Jam Wanted You, had sold over a million copies, and they only pressed and released something like 89,000 of electric spanking, uh, which shows us it was Chairman Mao had a thing called a Red Book that was studied by uh, radicals in the 60s. And one of the, the teachings that he had in that, one of his lines was, he who controls distribution is in control. So uh, uh, we got a lesson of that firsthand. Warner Brothers was controlling the distribution of the product, and there was nothing we could do about it. And so that put a, put. A, so when you say it peaked, uh, uh, yeah, things started to wane at, right around that time. And and the thing that really set it off was Roger not delivering the product to uh, to CBS. So CBS was mad at us. Warner Brothers was mad at us. Polygram, who had bought Casablanca, was mad at Neil Bogart because Neil Bogart was doing it with smoke and mirrors. And, um, you know, one of the big stories was that uh, he released this album on, on Johnny Carson, like uh, it was a late night comedy album. And he said he got more returns back than, than records he officially pressed. So Neil did all kind of tricks like that in the business. And Polygram, when they got the books together, uh, they uh, uh, didn't think that it wasn't as lucrative a buy as they thought it was going to be uh, for whatever reasons. It, it came out to us when they did the audit that the only group that was actually in the black at Casablanca from a corporate standpoint was Parliament because all of the pop acts, he was spending so much money through radio and, and advertising and stuff like that that the record sales, although they were big, uh, were not uh, 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 covering the expenditure. So it well, was think, a cash flow thing. Hmm? Um, Archie, I think also uh, bombs like uh, Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band didn't help either. <laughs> yeah, 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 that, that's true. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, uh, and an uh, interesting thing, they, they decided to shut down the office uh, in uh, a polygram decided to shut down Casablanca Records, which was on Sunset in Hollywood. They loaded all the, uh, the, 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 the books and files up and he put it on a truck. And that truck mysteriously caught fire outside Cleveland on its way back to New York. So they had no idea. And the people there were uh, not really receptive to the whole Casablanca thing. So Warner Brothers was mad at us. CBS couldn't put any more money in our hands because we weren't delivering the product that we had said we would. And then Polygram was, um, uh, 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 they, didn't, they didn't like the whole Casablanca thing. So here it was, the three major outlets we were froze out of. And it was, and all that was uh, the domino effect fallout from the Roger Troutman thing. And this, you know, it was uh, a, a lot of people uh, and, and people that were close to the situation, uh, they tried to point a finger at the drugs that was being used. And I remember uh, George once saying, he said, uh, I don't have a problem with anybody doing drugs, but they just have to try not to give drugs a bad name. Meaning that anything you do, you mess up, it's you messing up. Don't blame the drugs for it. Okay. And, uh, you know, even to the point now where he, he even says that he was he was high, so he wasn't paying attention and stuff. That's a good political way to get out of it. But we know that there were other factors that were more dominant. It wasn't like he was he spent like the rumors have it. He spent all the money on drugs. No, the money dried up because the big distributors wouldn't do business with us. That's actually how he ended up in by eighty two, on uh, just a couple years later, how he ended up on Capital. That was only yeah. one left. And, and, and Bootsy's uh, ended with Warner Brothers in 82, just a, a year after Funkadelic. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, and then when, when you said we were still in the contract, that lawsuit with Roger, see, what, what, I'm sorry, okay, I, I didn't get to that point, I don't think. But that, that judge who was going to, view, to handle the Westmoreland uh, case was the same judge we're going to have ours. And so he cleared his docket because this was going to be TV cameras, six o'clock news every night. They were going to be talking about this 
Westmoreland versus CBS. Uh, and he cleared his thing. So, uh, and he gave a summary judgment saying that we would not prevail in uh, in court, but if we wanted to, we could appeal. Um, and and so he just cleared his docket. Uh, we didn't have the money at that time to because the cash flow had dried up. We didn't have the money to uh, uh, undertake because the lawyers wanted something like a fifty thousand dollar retainer to um, to take to begin the appeal, appellate process. And so that's what happened in terms of actually how the thing crashed in on itself. So, well, what was the um, mood like in the P Funk camp and with George around that time? Was he like upset or getting bummed out about the situation? George didn't really get bummed out about anything. George is, he's always excited about the next thing that's going to happen. Oh, uh, one of the uh if there was ever a person you know a lot of the 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 wisdom of the, the how to deal with stuff and the oriental approach to not oriental meaning that ancient wisdom not i know that word is not uh, to be used in association with a people but that that uh, philosophy uh, it is um to live life in the moment and I believe George really does that. Uh, he he's happy with uh, what's going on right there. Uh, he's he's happy if he's staying at uh, the St. Regis Hotel, and he's just as happy if he's staying at the Motel Six. I mean, that's that's how he is. He's happy if he's eating uh, uh, lamb chops and caviar, and he's just as comfortable eating spam. Okay. If he's wearing gold or wearing a bed sheet. <laughs> exactly. Right. That, that's him. And, and so he he was not upset. A lot of people around them, uh, their dreams were being put on hold because he wasn't able. And he kept it going for a while. Uh, uh, we kept, uh, we had two offices by this time. We were running one in L.A. and running one in Detroit and constantly recording. So um, it was uh, that was eventually the stuff that would come out as um, not sample some of this, but it was another series. I, it escapes me now. Oh, the, fa the family series. The family series, exactly. It was the family series came out. We, we, we were keeping on recording right then. He was still trying to, and, but everybody was looking on, on, at their their projects. It became to be very. Um, me focused as opposed to us focused, if that makes uh, 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 any sense. Uh, uh, so there was a lot of disappointment. There was a lot of uh, jealousy, a lot of rumors, and a lot of people seeing their own reasons or uh, coming up with their own reasons why they uh, they felt things were slowing down. Let's talk about the uh, move to capital. You know, how did he strike? that deal and um couldn't use the parliament of funkadelic names at that point right <laughs> right yeah well um the uh yeah let me think now yeah nobody was 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 going to touch those names because the contracts had not technically expired um but we could have challenged it uh, that they were 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 uh use that they were usable and, and it might have just been Parliament. It might, Funkadelic might have been available because we did settle with Warner Brothers, and that's how he got the rights back to those masters from Warner Brothers. Um, but the, um, the, the, the uh, 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 capital EMI, it was actually EMI. A guy named Don Grierson was, was behind that. I think he just passed recently. Um, but uh, they wanted to get into the black music game, and they had this guy. It was funny, his story. His name was Ted Curry, and he was a big DJ in New York. Uh, New York City had an interesting uh, club music scene because uh, certain clubs would just get hot because the end people would say, 
this is the hot club to go for, you know, like Studio 54 or whatever. And it rotated. So it, it rotated to this, this guy, Steve, uh, Ted Curry was from Long Island. And uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he, 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 he wasn't a dancer or anything, but he was a DJ. And he was a mixer at the club. And this club became the number one club. So what happened was that Frankie Crocker, who was uh, uh, who was the king of New York in terms of DJs. He had been off the air for a few years, and then they were hiring him back when WBLS uh, uh, had fallen below. I think it was called Kiss then. It was a station in New York called Kiss, and uh, so WBLS was down, and they decided to bring Frankie Crocker back in. And Frankie Crocker came in, and he wanted to have a music director. So he wanted to know who was the hot DJ in town. And it happened, so they pointed, this. well, this is the hot club. And so here's this guy, Ted Currier was there. Thing. So he hires him to be his music consultant, the music director for the station. Now, people in New York love Frankie Crocker, the New York rocker. Uh, uh, Frankie Crocker was a, he was a sharp dresser. He was, he was a smooth guy. He was perfect for New York. And on the next ratings book, WBLS BLS became the number one uh, station in the market. <laughs> so then uh, at the same time, Capitol Records was noticing they were the last to get into the game of really focusing on the black music department. So they were focusing on who is heavy in the black music, black music slash dance market. And so they wanted to know who was the guy who was behind the music for WBLS. So they said, well, this is guy Ted Curry. So they hire him to be the head of black music in uh, uh, for uh, EMI. And what was the fun capital EMI was in? And what was funny, when we were going to a concert in the, uh, uh, it was at the, not the Spectrum, but it was, I mean, outside of, uh, it was called a Capitol Center outside Washington, D.C. We were in the limo, and we were talking about things, and somebody mentions Miles Davis. And Ted was in the car with us because he was, he was coming to meet George and because they wanted to sign George. But basically, Ted had to approve it, right? And so we were all in there, George, and then we were discussing. Somebody mentioned Miles Davis. And this guy, Ted Curry, says, who is that? I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. And we, everybody looked at each other, wait a minute. This is the guy who is the head of black music at Capitol. So, uh, uh, and from that, he goes to, uh, he, he okay, he authorizes the signing for George. You know, George is a lovable guy, likable guy. He smiles at you and he's attentive to you. And, he, he, you know, you feel like you're the best person in the world when he's speaking to you because he lives in the moment. And at that moment, you are the most person, most important person in the world because you're the person sharing the space with him. That's just how he is. So, um, but it, it, so this guy, Ted Curry. He eventually now gets his name as co-producer for one of the greatest dance songs of all time, Atomic oh, Duck. Yeah. And uh, that's just a phenomenal story of being in the right place at the right time. It, it's uh, uh, that, that's how so that's how it came to be at, at Capitol. Uh, we went there right? because it was the only place left. It was the only game in town. They were the last major. It was either Capitol or RCA. Okay, and, and I'm not sure if they were merged then, but I don't think so. But RCA was fading fast, and Universal hadn't started. MCA hadn't picked up again yet. So uh, uh, they were still in, in, in between. And so Capital Express interest, and we could go there and stay in the market. And, and, well, when you mentioned Capital back then, Archie, about the only close thing I'm thinking the funk they might have had was Maze at the time. Yeah, they had maze. They didn't have any funk. They barely had black, but they had. <coughs> oh God, excuse me. <clears throat> Dally Cole, Peebo Bryson. Peebo Bryson was was it. And, uh, it's a great two guys to have. You only got two acts in your department. I never personally 
I never could really get Mays. I, I knew all the songs. I, I hummed them, but I couldn't understand the power. I went to a Mays concert, and it was like crazy. Ladies were throwing panties on stage at him and everything, and it was like, and to me, they're playing every song. It's, it sounded the same. They was in the same key, and they had the same patterns, and, and it just changed the lyrics. And it was it was not appealing to me, but women love Frankie Beverly. And uh, so Capitol had that going for him. And see, Capitol kept his doors open because they had, in their catalog, they had Nat King Cole. They had the Beatles. They had the album with Aretha Franklin and Ray Charles, I think. That was on Capitol. And uh, they had four or five titles that sold every year. I mean, Nat well, King Cole. They had the Beatles stuff, too, right? They had Beatles, yeah. They, they, I, mean, I failed to mention them, yeah. They had Beatles stuff. But, right? but you know, also thinking about it, I'm just thinking about it right now. A few years earlier, they did have Sun on Capitol. They were pretty funky. Yeah, but they didn't They didn't know what to do with them. Yeah. So uh, they had a couple of groups that, that passed through, but they didn't know because they didn't understand marketing. We had to fight to get them to release Atomic Dog. As a matter of fact, that's why it was the second single. Because it was it was radical departure, and if you, unless you were able to uh, 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 hear at your very primal instinct level, you weren't gonna gonna identify Atomic Dog. Yeah, the first single was Loopzilla. Right, exactly. Yeah, which I Computer. when I heard Atomic Dog, I couldn't believe that that was not the first. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so uh, they we put Loopzilla out. But as soon as the radio got the, uh, and I had that fight, but I didn't have any power by this time. It was like they knew we were the only game in town, so they were beating us up. Uh, you know, the, all the industry people talk, and they talk about George and how they, so we were like uh, very uh, restricted and constrained from what we could control because we weren't abusive, but we, were, we did flaunt. What it is, we did stuff, like I said, we put out records without even giving them to the record company first, even though we were giving it to the record company. But by the time the record company had it, it was already in rotation heavily on the radio station. So um, Capital was, was not hearing any of that. And um, <laughs> so we, we couldn't fight. It was just like a wasted claw, cause to try to get them to do that. So we went with Loopzilla. But as soon, I mean, like the day the the DJ, the radio station got their hands on the album, they started playing Atomic Dog. And Atomic Dog didn't stop playing on the radio for almost 10 or 12 years. You were going to hear it once in every, in, 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 on the black station in every city, literally for 10 to 12 years. Well, and then it became like the foundation of about a third of all rap songs, especially yeah. West Coast rap. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's that was just, another one with a great 12 inch single too yeah yeah it was <laughs> and uh, that was probably the last one we did with roger uh that, that that we did that yeah it was it was that one was hard to to get a, a mix on and um and we also signed another artist pretty c and uh Dr. we yeah and, and that that was that's basically we used the same track for Tommy dog to do that, that thing, yeah. <laughs>